Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Finance Minister Tito Mboweni has unveiled a 38.9 billion rand relief package to support businesses affected by South Africa's recent deadly riots, as well as poor citizens and vulnerable workers who continue to be affected by the COVID-19 lockdowns. Terence Greenway joins me to discuss the package. Hi, Terence. Hi, Chanel. What is the background to this package and how is it being financed? Well, the two overarching backgrounds are really the continuing COVID crisis, which is leading to government taking measures to lock down the economy, which is affecting a number of sectors, is affecting uh, employment prospects and employment. So it's left a lot of uh, citizens vulnerable at this stage, both workers and poor citizens. And then obviously the uh, property destruction and the looting that took place uh, uh, in, late, in July that has affected both the, the image of the economy, the growth prospects for the economy, but most immediately, it's affected a number of businesses and workers in Gauteng and in uh, KwaZulu Natal that are looking to try and re recover and rebuild. What are the main spending and tax relief components? Well, the package is made up of, uh, it's 38.9 billion in total. It's made up of 36.2 or so billion of new money, and then a reprioritized re re budget out of the DTRC and the uh, Department of Small Business Development of about 2.7 billion. So that gives the full package. And really the spending components of that are, the big item is 27 billion to restart the 350 rand a month social relief grant, which was stopped in May. Uh, 5.3 billion using UIF, to re resume in certain sectors the TERS benefits for workers in those sectors, especially affected by the recent uh, alert level four lockdown. Then there's nearly four billion for SASRIA. That's the insurance company, the state-owned insurance company that, uh, that insures for riots and for looting and the sort of events that we saw uh, in South Africa in recent times. And that needs a backstop. It's got a certain amount, about 15 billion of its own resources, but the claims are going to are likely to be more from the insured companies. We've had about 50 billion rands worth of damage from that looting. Obviously, not everyone is insured under SASRIA, but at least between 15 and 20 billion worth of claims are likely to come. So the Treasury has offered this nearly 4 billion backstop to SASRIA. Then there's 2.3 billion <coughs> coming. Uh, one in the form of an additional new 1 billion to the DTRC and then, and then reprioritize budgets within the DTRC and the, uh, the, the Department of Small Business Development uh, for an amount of uh, 2.3 billion to support businesses that are not really insured. These are small businesses, township economy businesses that wouldn't have been insured, some of which are not even uh, fully tax paying entities fairly informal, and I think that is going to be a tricky item of expenditure, but that, that is an important one to get some of those businesses back on their feet. Then there's 700 million Rand for the Defence Force for this big deployment to bring peace and security back, and 250 million for the police to also restore law and order. And then on the tax side, there's about 5 billion worth of tax relief, um, deferments around PAYE for three months for smaller sized companies, uh, the extension and expansion of the employment tax incentive for more businesses to employ younger people at a lower, or those that are earning lower income, and then uh, deferral on excise duties for alcohol companies. So you can see it's a multi prom package uh, and it's got a combination of um, new money coming in, and that new money is mostly coming from improved tax revenue collections over the first quarter of the year, mostly from the mining sector, and then some reprioritized expenditure. Is this a precursor to a permanent basic income grant? I think that is a question on everyone's lips. You know, a 350 uh, rand a month grant was uh, is something like a basic income grant. The qualification criteria were not very rigorous. Um, so I think there's a national conversation, I think, that needs to be happening in a, in a context of such high unemployment and poverty. Uh, and the fact that our grants so far 
our child support and our other sort of uh, grants um, have been fairly effective in, um, in staving off poverty for millions of South Africans. There's a lot of a clamor for basic income grants. Obviously, the National Treasury has, has been resisting this. This is a temporary, uh, a temporary resolution of the 350 rand a month grant, and it's really only been made affordable by these above expectations revenue collections, um, and it's not really affordable. Uh, you can't count on commodity prices being high forever, so you can't bank on that to, to uh, sustain a long-term basic income grant. But I think it is a period now which gives us some breathing space to have a policy discussion, um, to have a discussion about how we bring relief to so many people outside of the economy and are so desperate. And that is, you know, that was uh, in, in some ways the tinder for when there was the insurrection activities uh, for other people to take that beyond that uh, initial insurrection activities into sort of a, a wild uh, looting spree. So we do have this <clears throat> poverty underlay to the recent rioting and uh, this uh, grant could help alleviate some of the poverty. Obviously it's a very small amount, but it's definitely not sustainable and under the current fiscal framework where we trying to consolidate and bring back our deficits and debt projections. This is a once off. So a conversation will be, have to be had over the next few months as to what we're going to do. What does this say about the importance of mining? Well, it just shows you that this uh, sector, the mining sector remains a major engine of this economy. It doesn't always fire, but at this stage, as the world recovers from COVID, and there's a huge demand for the sort of minerals that we are producing in South Africa. We're having these windfall uh, tax revenues from the sector. We also see uh, the shareholders are getting windfall dividends at the moment. So this is a very important productive sector of the economy. We've seen both agriculture and mining, two key productive sectors, really showing strong resilience during this COVID period. And if it weren't for the windfalls that we've been getting from these high commodity prices, which are I mentioned we can't bank on forever, but if it weren't for that, it would have been very difficult to announce this uh, 39 billion in social relief um, and remain within the fiscal framework that was announced in the February budget, but it has made this possible. What will replace the package when it comes to an end in March next year? At this stage, nothing. This is very much, uh, there's a line in the sand that this is all, these are all temporary measures to deal with COVID and to deal with the riots. They're not there permanently. But I think really the, the sustainable package has to be about the economic reforms. I mentioned mining earlier and its, its importance. These high levels of dividends that the companies are paying are, are wonderful for shareholders. But on the other hand, it shows that there's a lack of opportunity to reinvest these dividends into especially exploration and development activity. We, we've really been underperforming in terms of exploration for many, many years and to get the next pipeline of projects ready. And also in, for instance, in sustaining the long-term viability of these mines by building, for instance, renewable energy projects around them, which are also long-term investments. So I think these reforms are important. One, we need reforms in mining to really make it attractive for explorers to start exploration and uh, development activities at a larger scale in South Africa to build that pipeline. We know that the energy transition is a metals and min minerals intensive transition. We know that South Africa has a number of the metals and minerals that are going to be needed for that. So this is a long-term trajectory. Yes, it will be sore tooth in Malaysia. We won't always have these high commodity prices, but the trajectory is that metals and mineral prices, especially ones that are linked to the transition, are going to be sort of fairly, they're gonna have a strong underpin as we transition from an oil-based economy to more of a renewables-based economy. So we need to get those reforms in place to do the exploration and development, to get the energy infrastructure in place that will sustain that. We know that we've got this 100 megawatt reform coming through, but the devil's gonna be in the detail. And we haven't seen what the new schedule two of the Electricity Regulation Act is going to really look like and whether it's gonna really unlock uh, those investments or not. We can see how important our ports and roads infrastructure are. Uh, as we saw with the riots when that N3 was closed, it was uh, calamitous for the economy. And with the cyber attack on the ports recently, 
that again adds to the uh, to the worries around whether South Africa can sustain its position as a gateway to Africa. So the reforms in the port sector and opening up those ports to private investment is very, very important and a very significant reform that is needed. And then obviously the spectrum release. So, but really the next stage, because we have these limitations around our fiscal framework, the next stage really has to be about pushing for growth. And uh, that's going to really be the key driver of employment and social protection without growth in this economy, and uh, which is going to have to be fueled really by private sector investment. We're not going to be at a level where we can tackle these challenges that created this, this dry tinder for the recent unrest that we saw in Gauteng and KwaZulu Natal. Thank you. That's the second take show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily email newsletter.